Calvary family. We are grateful that you're with us today. Uh, this has been quite the, the week. We started out with snow and it's been uh, some rain during the week, but things are lush, they're beautiful, daffodils are blooming, crab apples are ready to burst forth. Uh, a number of you have been out fishing, hope that that's gone well for you. It's uh, just a beautiful time of year. Uh, one thing that we want you to know is we certainly appreciate your faithfulness in giving here at Calvary. The last uh, six, eight weeks, we have tried so hard to be very conservative in our spending. And we have cut back on some things that we were looking, we were looking at the possibility um, as part of our plan to uh, look at a building, potential building project coming up the next a year or so. Uh, that's been put on the back burner for right now. And yet God has opened up an opportunity for us that we, were, we never saw uh, coming. And that is the property directly across the street from our parking lot has come up for sale. And that really fits strategically into the direction the church would like to go because we would like to stay on this site, on this property, and that additional property would really allow us um, to uh, do that. So we are in the process of praying that process through and seeking the Lord as far as that is concerned. And coming up on the 26th of May... We're going to have a Zoom meeting that is an information meeting. It's also a time of prayer. And we will be sending out an email with a link for that if you would like to participate in that Zoom meeting. And then coming up on Monday, June 1st, we are also having a congregational business meeting. And we're offering two different formats for you as far as that's concerned. One format could be a Zoom format. And the other format would be an in-person format where we'd have small groups of 10 or less where you'd meet with uh, one of the elders and we'd have the opportunity to uh, discuss um, this property and then um, vote on that. So if you are interested in that, we certainly want you to uh, participate. Uh, we would appreciate your prayer. There will be a card on the website as far as that congregational meeting coming up on June the 1st. And like I said earlier, we'll be sending out an email with a link on the meeting on May 26th, which is prayer and information about this potential property purchase. Also next week, we have two different other prayer meetings. One is coming up uh, 1 o'clock on Wednesday afternoon. It's a regular congregational prayer meeting. And then uh, on Thursday night from 6.30 until 8 o'clock, we have a prayer summit for our missionaries where we specifically take time, set time aside to uplift uh, our missionary families and their uh, um, work uh, across not only this country and our area here with our native ministries that we support, but also missionaries around the world. So we want to encourage you, if you are interested in either of those, to let the office know. We'll send you an uh, email link how you can participate in those Zoom prayer meetings Wednesday at 1 and then 6.30 on Thursday. Well, our call to worship this morning comes from the book of Jeremiah, the 17th chapter. This is what the Lord says. Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans, who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. They're like stunted shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. They will live in the barren wilderness, in an uninhabited salty land, but blessed, blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They're like trees planted along a river bank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never, never stop producing fruit. Let's continue to worship the Lord together.
Heavenly Father, we thank you that in Christ alone, we have all that we need. That in the midst of life coming at us with its difficulties and its trials, Lord, we thank you so much that we don't have to rely on ourselves, on our own merit, on our own abilities, that we don't have to worry about what this world is sowing at us because Christ alone is enough for us this morning. So, Father, as we close and as we sing this next song in Christ alone, would be reminded of the faith that we have in Jesus, reminded of the hope that we have in him, reminded of the life that we have in him. Father, give us joy as we proclaim the gospel back to you and remind ourselves of Christ and his goodness. We love you and we thank you. And we continue to worship you now in Jesus' name.
Once again, we're going to uh, pause here to just uh, pray. Um, this is our traditional offering time. We already talked about your faithfulness um, earlier in our service, but thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness and giving to the Lord's work here at Calvary. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful uh, day. Uh, thank you for the springtime. Thank you for the rain that you've given us the last week. Lord, we thank you for the warmer temperatures that are forecasted for this next week. It's beautiful to see uh, many of the flowers that are blooming now and, and the crab apple and apple trees that are starting to go into bloom and the choke cherries starting to smell them and it's just a, a beautiful time of year. Thank you for the open water and for the fishing season and for um, just the sights and the sounds of the Northland that we enjoy so much. Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness to the ministry here at Calvary. I thank you for your faithfulness to our families. Lord, I pray that you would bring hope and encouragement to those who are discouraged. I pray that you would continue to bring wisdom to our political leaders and those making important decisions about not only our state but our country. Uh, Lord, there's no doubt that in a country this size of 325 million people, we need to um, get this economy going. And yet, Lord, um, we need to do it in a way that is safe. And, Lord, we need wisdom for that. So I pray that you would just uh, bless um, our leaders with um, wisdom and courage. Lord, I pray that you continue to keep our families here at Calvary safe, safe from this COVID virus. Lord, continue to provide for the needs that we have, not only um, physical needs, Lord, but emotional needs, um, social needs. Um, we miss one another. We miss worshiping together. Uh, this is one of the joys that we have as a body to get together on a, a regular basis to, to celebrate you and to celebrate what you're doing. And we have not been able to corporately do that, and that's been hard. But, uh, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to um, stay connected not only with one another, but Lord, may we, during this time, may we be even greater uh, connected to you. May our dependence upon you, may our love for you, may the hope and the peace that we find in you, may that only strengthen within all of us, within our families. And Lord, as we reach out to bring hope to those around us, hope to our community, I pray just a blessing upon this Leech Lake community and our walker um, Laporte, Nevis, Akeley, Park Rapids, Hackensack, Bacchus, Bemidji, Cass Lake, our whole community, Lord, we pray your blessing upon this area. And Lord, we thank you that we get to live here. We pray for our neighbors that are scared and our neighbors who are in need, Lord, we pray that you would supply all their needs according to your riches and according to your glory. And Lord, just thank you that we can worship you this morning. Thank you for what you're doing in our church family. Thank you for the opportunities that you're opening up for us as a church. Thank you even for the, the step of faith that we are looking at this property across the street from the church, Lord. It would be a huge step of faith at this point for us, but you have opened up a door that strategically fits right within the direction that this church would like to go, direction that you have led us uh, in the past that we've kind of put on the back burner because of this COVID-19 uh, virus. But now you have opened up a door. And Lord, I pray that you give us wisdom as we seek your heart in this matter. So thank you for this time of worship. We pray your blessing upon the rest of our service now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Calvary, and good morning, Central Community Church watching from South Minneapolis. We're so glad you can be with us on what is really a beautiful Sunday morning. Um, we are in John's Gospel today, chapter 15, and we're talking about the vine and the branches and our relationship with God. So before we jump into the Bible piece, I want to tell you a little story. Many years ago, Karen and I had a little family, and we lived in a little town called Ada, and we had a little house with a little backyard and I wanted to put in a little flower bed in back. And what happened was a little weed vine popped up. 
and I tore it out and it came back. In fact, it came back strong enough that I ran over it with the lawnmower. Well, the next year it came back again and it was very aggressive, so I got more aggressive with the little weed vine because frankly, I didn't want it. It kept coming back. So I had a big dog in a big dog kennel and the big dog needed some shade. So I dug up the little weed vine because I thought, you know what? It would grow over that kennel and give big dog some big shade. So that's what I did in the first year that little weed vine grew eight feet and the dog got the shade, fantastic. <clears throat> well, winter came and went and the next year that little weed vine, it grew 15 feet and then a funny thing happened the weed vine put on clusters of grapes. Turns out the weed that I didn't want, it was a grapevine all along. I didn't know what I had. I tried to get rid of it. Well, it kept coming back. Well, the day came when we moved out of that town and we moved out of that little house. And before the moving trucks showed up, the last job I had to do was to dig up that vine. <clears throat> I put it in a bucket and I brought it to Walker and it's right here behind me where it's been in our front yard for 18 years. Now I'll tell you what, I have no, many, no idea how many gallons and gallons and gallons of grapes this vine has produced, but I will tell you this, it's fed our family for over 20 years. That's what grape vines do. When they're healthy, when they're alive, they produce fruit. Well folks, Jesus used that picture as a picture of his relationship with us the vine, the branches, and the gardener. And that's what we're gonna talk about this morning. So we're gonna go back to church, and if you got a Bible, go, back, go ahead and open it up to John 15. All right, if you have your Bible open or Bible on your phone, I'm reading out of the New Living Translation, the Gospel of John, chapter 15, and I wanna invite you to read along with me if you would. Jesus said, I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I've given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you, for a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches, those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. So the branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want, and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples." This brings great glory to my Father. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. <clears throat> this is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves <clears throat> because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends, since I have told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask using my name. This is my command love each other. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father in heaven, this day we come to you uh, glad that you have demonstrated your love for the whole world by giving your son Jesus to be our Savior and Lord. And Jesus, thank you that you did not leave us alone, but you've given us your Holy Spirit to produce in us everything that the Father desires. <clears throat> uh, Lord, today we want to pray for our seniors who will be experiencing different kinds of graduation this year. They've reached a milestone, and yet so much that they would have looked forward to this year is not happening. We pray, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit will lift their spirits 
and give them a sense of peace and joy in spite of their circumstances. And Lord, we pray for those all across northern Minnesota who are fighting fires these days. We do pray for rain for this entire region, and we do pray for the strength, wisdom, safety, and protection over all of our firefighter teams across this part of the country. And now, Lord, as we come to your word, we pray that you'll speak to us, and we pray that our hearts would be open for what you have for us in John 15. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. So we are talking about the vine and the branches. Uh, here's what today is about. Uh, Jesus wants to put his peace, love, and joy into your heart so that it flows through your life to the people around you. When that happens, you are living as Jesus' disciple, and you are bringing glory to God the Father. You are experiencing the life change that the Holy Spirit wants to produce in all of us. <clears throat> so for that to happen, uh, we need to trust Jesus enough to obey him. So as we come to our passage today, I want to talk to you about three things. Uh, first, I want to talk to you about Jesus, the true vine. Uh, secondly, I want to talk to you about when Jesus prunes us, because that's part of the process. And third, I want to talk to you about the produce. What is it that Jesus is seeking to produce in our lives? <clears throat> so we begin with Jesus the vine, first one. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Now that simple picture is hugely important for helping us see how Jesus ties together the entire story of the Bible from the Old Testament to the New Testament. You see, in the Old Testament, that picture of a vine and God the gardener is a picture that God used to talk about his people Israel, the nation of Israel. <clears throat> um, the Bible says in the Old Testament, Psalm 80, that Israel was a grapevine that God had transplanted out of Egypt and put in the promised land. And um, that Psalm 80 is a prayer and a request for God to look on his grapevine that is ruined and have mercy on it. So in Jesus' time, if you went to the temple, there was a great gate in front of it, and at the front of the entrance of the temple, there was a golden grapevine that represented the nation of Israel, and it was huge. The historian Josephus says that there were golden clusters of grapes that were the size of a man on the front of the temple. So it could well be that uh, in the days before Jesus' crucifixion, perhaps even that night as they left to leave Jerusalem to go to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus and the disciples may well have very recently seen the front of the temple there with that golden grapevine representing Israel. <clears throat> now here's the deal. The grapevine actually tells a sad story because the truth is God planted a good grapevine, but he got bad grapes. So in Isaiah 5, it says, God looked for the fruit of justice, and he got oppression. He looked for the fruit of righteousness, but he found violence. In Jeremiah 2, same story. God uh, planted a good vineyard, but it cr produced corrupt fruit. Ezekiel tells the same story in chapter 19. Uh, Israel was a lush green vine, but because of sin and idolatry, it was uprooted and torn down. Uh, Hosea 10, same story again. God planted Israel as a beautiful vine loaded with fruit. But Hosea says the richer they got, the more corrupt they became through sin and idolatry. He says the richer they got, the more pagan altars they built. <clears throat> so Ezekiel says they cultivated wickedness and harvested sin until God chose to cut it all down. So we come back to Psalm 80. It's a song and a prayer. The vineyard, Israel, is destroyed, and the psalm is asking God to look on his vineyard and have mercy on it. Uh, the psalm says, Lord, see our plight and take care of this grapevine. Well, I want you to understand, Jesus is the answer to that prayer. Jesus is the answer that all of the Old Testament was waiting for. <clears throat> the vineyard of Israel had been destroyed more than once, and that very temple that Jesus and the disciples walked past would itself be destroyed in a matter of a few decades. But Jesus is the true vine, and God the Father has planted Jesus in Israel and in the world to produce the kind of fruit that God is looking for. Righteousness, godliness, peace, joy, love. And what Jesus wants to do is push his peace, love, and joy into you and through you 
to bless the world and to honor God the Father. <clears throat> now, when we trust Jesus, we are connected to him. When we trust Jesus by faith, he gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is God living in us. And the Spirit of God begins to change us and produce in us what we could never produce on our own. So that the Bible uses words like, we are living in Christ and Christ is living in us. We have been put in the Spirit and the Holy Spirit has been put in us so that the life of God can push into and push through our lives. Now, that's a beautiful thing to think about, <clears throat> but it also comes with another part of the picture, and that is this picture of pruning. Every gardener knows the importance of pruning fruit plants. It makes them produce more and better fruit. So <clears throat> I've got a grapevine at home, and if you ever saw me pruning it, you would see me giving it quite the haircut. In fact, if you didn't know anything about gardening, you'd probably think I was trying to kill it, because I tell you what, when I'm done pruning my grape, there is a whole lot of vine on the ground, because what I'm getting rid of is anything that's diseased and anything that is excessive but not essential. So how does Jesus uh, prune away deadwood in our lives? He does it through his word. Uh, he says that if we don't remain in him, that is, if we don't love, trust, and obey him, we are cut off. We become deadwood that is disconnected from the life of God. That's what happened to Judas Iscariot. Judas was a follower of Jesus. He was a disciple. He had seen the miracles. He had heard everything. And yet at this very hour, he was betraying Jesus. He had refuse to remain in Christ. When a person rejects Christ, they cut themselves off from the life of God that Jesus is offering us. They wither, the love and joy and peace begin to fade because they're cut off from the eternal life that we're meant to have in God. But branches that remain in Christ, those who do trust, love, and obey Jesus, they get pruned. They get pruned by the word of God that seeks to change our life to move us in the direction of peace and joy and love. So what gets pruned away? Well, the word of Christ prunes away our sin. Uh, the word of Christ will prune away our pride and our ego, our lust, our lies, our selfishness, our hatred, our resentments, our grumblings. The word of Christ will speak into our hearts and minds, and when we cooperate with what the Holy Spirit wants to do, he begins to prune away the sin in our life that is contrary to everything God wants to produce. But it is not just sin that gets pruned away from our lives. When you think about getting pruned, you also think of things that may not be necessarily sinful or evil, but they are not essential to what God is doing. Uh, think again about that pruning process. When I cut away those excess branches, the reason that I'm doing that is it allows more sunshine to get to the grapes. It allows more airflow so the uh, plant doesn't get diseased, and it reserves more energy for the grape clusters. When you have a grapevine, you don't need 20 feet of leaves. What you're looking for is that handful of good grapes that is, what, uh, is, that is the reason that you're growing the grape in the first place. So it may be things that are in our life that are not necessarily evil, but they are things that God may choose to remove to forward his purposes in our lives. So think about it this way. <clears throat> if I am going to give time to serve the Lord, something else in my life is going to get pruned away to make room for that time. If I am going to give money to the Lord or for charitable purposes, there is something in my life that is going to get pruned away that's not going to happen in order that I can do that giving. You can think of it in terms of investing in my spiritual life. If I invest time and energy into my spiritual life, something else in life, which may not be a bad thing, is going to get pruned away to make room and to give more energy so that the things that God is seeking to produce um, can grow. So I'll give you one personal example of this. Uh, years ago, we were living in another community, and I was serving another church. And our church went through a pruning time, and I personally went through a pruning time. We were a small congregation, and we had had several families leave and move away. And when you're in a small church, that's a big deal. 
<coughs> well, the pruning continued. Uh, someone in church decided that I was the problem, that something wrong in my life must have caused God to take his blessing off our church. So that precipitated a very challenging six months. And what happened during that time is, um, you know, I didn't know if I was still going to have a job. I didn't know what would happen to the church if I left or got fired. Part of me wanted to just walk away from it all. Part of me was afraid that the church might fall apart if I did. Uh, I really didn't know what to do. I looked at my wife and my kids at night, and I said, what are we going to do? Um, I felt like I had lost my sense of financial security, my job security, my ego, my competence. It felt like everything in my life was up in the air and that a lot of things that I held on to pretty tightly were being cut away. Well, what happened? Uh, God used that time both for me personally and in our church to lead to greater fruitfulness. And the next couple of years after that, we experienced a season of fruitfulness in the church that was really a beautiful thing to see. Um, but also in my own life, I look back on that as being one of the most important seasons in my life of God being at work in me to change me in the direction of peace and joy and love. So I don't regret it, even though it was difficult. I wouldn't necessarily wish it on anybody else, but I will say this, it was not wasted. God used it. So if you are going through a season of pruning right now, if you are losing or giving up things that maybe you've hung on to pretty tightly, don't fear the pruning. God knows what he is doing. Now, what is it that God wants to produce? Well, it is peace, it's joy, and it's love. It's everything that results from obeying the word of Christ. It's everything that shows the world that you really are his disciple. It's everything that brings honor to God because it brings blessing to the world. It's what flows out of the life of Christ when the life of Christ flows into you. It's everything that puts love into action. It's everything that brings good changes in us that affects our community in a positive way and that ultimately puts a smile on the face of God our Father. It's a peace of Christ. Uh, everybody in the world wants peace, and you don't realize how valuable peace is until you don't have it. Well, the Holy Spirit wants to push the peace of Christ into our problems and then empower us to give it away to others. Joy. Joy is something that every person in the world longs for, but where do you find it? We can chase all kinds of things looking for joy that often turns out to be temporary or to not maybe measure up to the advertisements. So the Bible says joy is very important. Joy is energizing. The Bible says that joy, um, that the joy of the Lord is our strength. So you know what that's like when you are despairing or depressed, you feel lethargic, you don't feel like you can get up and do what you need to do. But when you are joyful, there's an exuberance, there's an energy, there's an empowerment that comes with that. It does not mean that we never have problems. It doesn't mean that we don't grieve and mourn. Uh, it's unrealistic to think that I will live on an emotional high all the time. Uh, just read Psalms. In the Psalms, you have uh, Psalms that are written at the high points of life, the celebration moments, but you also have Psalms that are written in the low points of life and the darkest periods. And all of that is part of the Christian life. But we do believe that God never runs out of joy and that he does want us to come to him, even in our darkest times, seeking from him the peace and the love and the joy that we need, especially when we realize that our tank is dry. <clears throat> so I want to give you a a couple suggestions for experiencing the joy of the Lord. I think these are important. Number one, the Bible says rejoice in the Lord always. Uh, rejoice is not a noun, it's a verb. It's not a feeling, it's an action. It is giving back to God an expression of gratitude and joy for what God has done in my life and for what God has given me. So when you go through those dark times, and everybody does, don't lose sight of the grace of God and what God has still given you, what God has still provided for you, <coughs> the way he has protected you in the past and the promises that he's given you for the future. Don't lose sight of that. <clears throat> Put that joy into words, into actions, into music, <clears throat> because um, maybe you've heard the phrase, uh, fake it till you make it. 
there is a part of that that is part of the Christian life. Uh, it doesn't mean that I don't acknowledge my feelings, but it does mean that my feelings don't get to have the last word. There are times when I have to face and own my feelings, and yet by faith choose to press forward in obedience to Christ. And sometimes that's what it means to rejoice in the Lord always. <clears throat> uh, second thing, the Bible says, mourn with those who mourn, that is, share their sorrow. And then it says, also, rejoice with those who rejoice. So there is something to sharing other people's pain, but there is also something to sharing other people's happiness. And if you want your joy tank to be more full more frequently, develop a habit of celebrating other people's successes. Develop a habit of sharing in other people's victories. When you do that, you contribute to their joy and you have multitude of opportunities to celebrating um, what you see God doing in the lives of people around you, and it helps get your attention off yourself. So mourn with those who mourn, absolutely, but also don't miss the opportunity to rejoice with those who rejoice. Joy is one of those things that the more we give it away, the more we end up receiving. Uh, last fruit that Jesus wants to produce in us, and that is love. Love is important. Love is the most important thing according to the Bible. Uh, love comes from the heart of God. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit have been loving each other forever. That's what in the last few weeks we called mashed potato love. And out of that overflow of love, God wants to pour his love into us, and he wants us to enter into his love. The Spirit wants to take the love from the heart of God and put it in your heart until it comes out to the people around you. <clears throat> he wants to fill you up to overflowing. Think about how it works for grapes. Uh, the vine is there. It's got roots in the ground, and um, from the roots come water and nutrients. Uh, the vine has leaves toward the sky, and the sun beats down on those leaves, and the energy coming from the sun and the nutrients coming from the soil combine to fill that vine up until what you get is grapes. Uh, they are the result of a process that God has created. And when we come to the Word of God, when we ask the Spirit of God for help, uh, the life of God flows through us, resulting in change for ourselves that looks like and is love out to the people around us. So Jesus puts it uh, very clearly here. He says, this is my command, not a suggestion. This is my command, love each other. If Jesus is Lord, we love him by obeying him. And Jesus' command is that we obey him by loving the people he has put around us. And what kind of love is it? Um, Jesus doesn't just say, love your neighbor as yourself. That's true, that's in the Bible, but that's way back in the Old Testament law. Frankly, if you didn't know anything about Jesus or the Holy Spirit or the resurrection, God's expectation for you would still be to love your neighbor as yourself. That's not the high point of love, that is the starting point of love, and it's God's requirement. But if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, he doesn't leave you at love your neighbor as yourself. He says, love each other the way I have loved you. That is the high point of love. That is the goal that God has in store for us. So think about how Jesus loved people. That night at the Last Supper, nobody wanted to do the dirty work, so Jesus got down on his knees and cleaned their dirty, stinking feet. Uh, love is service. So let me ask, who do you serve? Uh, are you serving others other than yourself? If not, that's your growth point. That's the place to ask, Lord Jesus, who do you want me to serve? Show me who, show me how, give me the strength and love to serve others the way you would. Uh, secondly, <clears throat> uh, Jesus' love is a sacrificing love. In the morning, he would give his life for his friends, for his enemies, and for his world. So <clears throat> the love of Jesus is a sacrificial giving love. And the question is, who do you sacrifice for? What is it that you sacrifice? Do you sacrifice time? You only have so much of it. Do you sacrifice your energy? 
You only have so much of it. Do you sacrifice your resources? You only have so much of it. And Jesus gives the, us the example of pouring out his very life in order to rescue and save us forever. And that is the example that Jesus sets for us when he says, my command to you is to love one another. If you're not sacrificing for somebody else, then it's time to ask Jesus, Lord, what is it that you want me to give up to bless others in the name of Jesus? Uh, think about patience for a minute. The Bible says that love is patient. So let me ask, are you patient with the kind of people who try your patience? If not, that's your growth point. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you the patience of Jesus, particularly with the people who test your patience. Uh, let's talk about kindness. The Bible says love is patient and love is kind. Are you kind to the kind of people who make you kind of crazy? They will test your kindness. They will test your maturity. And if you have difficulty being kind to that kind of people, then that's your growth point. And it's time for you to ask the Lord Jesus to fill you up with the Holy Spirit so that you can be kind to the people who kind of make you kind of crazy. And when you are kind to them, it's not just you doing it. It's not just your willpower, but it's the Holy Spirit at work in your heart changing you in the direction of godliness, in the direction of peace and joy and love and fruitfulness. And that is what God's plan is for your life. Jesus wants to put his peace, his joy, and his love into you so that it pushes through your life into the people around you and that the world can see that you are a follower of Jesus and they know that God is your Father and that the Holy Spirit is at work in you. And when that happens, God is honored. Last thing for you. <clears throat> Next time you go to the store, buy some grapes. And when you take them home, don't just eat them. Take some time and look at them and think about them and remember, what is God doing in your life? What has God given for you in order to save you and transform you forever? Jesus gave his life for you. The Holy Spirit is giving you new power through his presence. And the Father loves you so much he would give his own son to make you fruitful forever. So with that, um, we're going to pray, and then I've got a little introduction to make. Let's pray. <clears throat> uh, Lord Jesus, would you show us what to do next? Would you hold up the Holy Spirit to us as a mirror so that we're really honest with ourselves about the condition of our heart and the direction of our life? And we just want to trust you, asking for your forgiveness where we've failed and receiving your mercy. But Lord God, we also want to receive your power. Would your Holy Spirit fill us so that we may live out what you are putting in? In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're going to have a closing song, and then I've got something special for you today. My father-in-law, Art Erickson, from Central Community Church, is going to be doing the benediction today. Many of you uh, know Art and Kathy, my in-laws. They've been up to visit many times, and Art has spoken here, and Art was kind enough to send up a benediction for today's service. So until we see you again, take care, God bless, and keep your eyes on Christ.
Erickson and I'm with the Central Church Fellowship and we have been with you the last several Sundays and really enjoyed our time with you. We've heard from John 15 this morning, reflect on it all week, and I have a verse to read from there before I pray. But if you live your life in me and my words live in your hearts, you can ask for whatever you like and it will come true for you. This is how my Father will be glorified, in your becoming fruitful and being my disciples. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving your Son and Son. Thank you for staying within the Father's relationship. And you gave this great analogy of the vine and the branches and the gardener. Thank you for this because you do remove every branch that does not bear fruit and you prune every branch that does bear fruit that it would be more bearing. And Lord, you're, you've got things going down right now. We're, you're, you're leveling us. You're, you're, you're pruning us right now. And you're making us think all the time, what is it that God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit want today. What they really want, what you really want is our attention and then you want us to be fruitful and be your disciples. May that happen this week as we make choices each day, each part of the day, each hour, each moment to follow you and discipline ourselves to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.